Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers, and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Naf Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 344 of our pharmacotherapy series, entitled Care of the Critically Ill Adult. The next case reads, JFA is a 28-year-old male who presents to the emergency room after a severe motor vehicle accident. He presents with hemorrhagic shock, multiple rib and leg bone fractures, and a traumatic brain injury. He is immediately intubated and taken to the operating room for control of his bleeding and initial management of his fractures. His past medical history is significant for opioid abuse and bipolar disorder. After the operation, JFA is transferred to the surgical ICU on mechanical ventilation with multiple chest tubes in place for management of injuries he sustained in the accident. So my question to you is, what causes of pain does JFA have and what complications might they cause? Up to 77% of patients discharged from ICUs report experiencing moderate or severe pain during their ICU stay. This pain occurs during rest and with activity and is the most common memory patients have of their ICU stays. Pain may occur because of injuries or diseases, therapeutic interventions, routine ICU care, or monitoring. Patients consistently report pain as the most traumatic memory from their ICU stay. During the ICU stay, untreated pain can result in increased energy requirements, hyperglycemia, muscle breakdown, immunosuppression, increased risk of wound infection, decreased tissue perfusion, psychological distress, and impaired sleep. Long-term complications of untreated pain include chronic pain syndromes, neuropathy, post-traumatic stress disorder, and a decreased health-related quality of life. In light of the acute and long-lasting consequences of pain as well as the prevalence of untreated pain in critically ill patients, it is important to diligently assess patients and utilize appropriate analgesics when indicated. In JFA, potential causes of pain include trauma, postoperative pain, and the presence of an endotracheal tube and chest tubes. During his ICU stay, he may experience pain from routine care, including turning, suctioning of respiratory secretions, and eventually physical therapy. The next question reads, how should JFA be assessed for pain in the ICU? Since patient-reported pain assessment is the optimal way to assess pain, whenever possible, clinicians should ask patients to rate their pain on a scale from 0 to 10 with 0 representing no pain and 10 representing the worst pain imaginable. For patients who cannot communicate with caregivers because of mechanical ventilation or other limitations, Clinicians should assess patients' pain scores using validated nonverbal pain assessment tools that utilize patients' behaviors as indicators of pain. The two nonverbal pain assessment tools recommended in guidelines are called the Behavioral Pain Scale and the Critical Care Pain Observation Tool. 
The maximum score on each tool is 12 and 8, respectively, with higher values indicating more severe pain. Pain assessment should be protocolized such that it routinely occurs throughout each day of the patient's ICU stay. Clinicians should set the goal pain level and utilize analgesics as needed to achieve it while considering potential adverse effects. Generally, hemodynamic parameters such as blood pressure, heart rate, and respiratory rate should not be used to assess pain because they can be affected by other factors and do not correlate with self-reported pain. However, changes in vital signs may be used as a cue to further assess patients. The next question reads, how should clinicians manage pain in critically ill patients like JFA? Opioids, including fentanyl, hydromorphone, morphine, methadone, and remifentanyl, are the primary analgesics used in the critical care setting. Of these, fentanyl, hydromorphone, and morphine are used most commonly, whereas methadone is mainly used for long-term pain or pain that is refractory to other opioids. Because it is very short-acting, very potent, and metabolized in the plasma, remifentanil is most appropriate for pain that lasts only a short period of time in patients who are mechanically ventilated and in those with severe renal or hepatic dysfunction. Meperidine should not be used because it may cause seizures and other complications. For treatment of acute pain, opioids should be given intravenously since enteral administration may be unreliable in critically ill patients, because of incomplete absorption in patients with altered gastrointestinal motility and intramuscular absorption can be erratic. In some cases, it may be impossible to completely alleviate pain because of dose-limiting side effects such as respiratory depression or altered mental status. In these cases, clinicians should attempt to make patients as comfortable as possible without inducing significant adverse effects. The selection of a specific opioid relates to the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the medications and depends on patient-specific characteristics as well as the nature of the pain the patient is experiencing. When given as a single intravenous bolus injection, fentanyl has a faster onset and shorter duration of action compared to hydromorphone and morphine. This makes an intravenous injection of fentanyl most appropriate for pain that is short-lived such as procedural pain that might be associated with placement of a chest tube or intravenous catheter. In fact, procedural pain is best treated preemptively through administration of a bolus agent before the procedure. The longer duration of action of hydromorphone and morphine makes these agents better when intravenous treatment of longer-lasting pain is indicated. Alternatively, fentanyl, hydromorphone, and morphine may all be administered as continuous intravenous infusions in patients needing ongoing analgesia or those with severe pain. All opioids can cause constipation, confusion, hallucinations, altered mental status, and respiratory depression when given in high doses. Clinicians should regularly monitor the bowel movements of patients receiving opioid analgesia and a bowel regimen containing both a stimulant laxative and a stool softener should be administered, if indicated. Opioids may all cause a decrease in blood pressure if the patient's blood pressure is increased because of pain and in patients who are hypovolemic. Importantly, morphine is the only opioid that causes histamine release, which can lead to flushing, bronchospasm, and hypotension. These complications underlie the recommendation to avoid morphine in patients who are hemodynamically unstable at risk for hypotension, or those with bronchospasm. Morphine has an active metabolite that is cleared by the kidneys, while fentanyl and hydromorphone are metabolized in the liver to inactive metabolites. Thus, 
hydromorphone and fentanyl are preferred over morphine in patients with renal failure. Another unique side effect relates to QTC prolongation resulting from methadone. Because QTC prolongation can potentially cause cardiac arrest, electrocardiograms should be regularly monitored in patients receiving methadone, especially in patients concurrently receiving other QTC prolonging agents. Serum concentrations of magnesium and potassium should be monitored, and these electrolytes should be repleted, as needed, to minimize arrhythmias. Because fentanyl is the most lipophilic of the three most commonly used opioid analgesics, prolonged administration via intravenous infusion may lead formation of a depot in adipose tissue. After cessation of the fentanyl infusion, drug may distribute from the fat into the bloodstream and prolong the effects of drug. In addition to opioids, Clinicians may consider adjunctive analgesics in selected patients. For example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents and acetaminophen may be considered to minimize overall opioid requirements and potentially reduce opioid-related complications. For patients experiencing neuropathic pain, enterally administered gabapentin and carbamazepine can be helpful. Finally, for patients with rib fractures or those who have undergone thoracic or abdominal surgery, thoracic epidural analgesia results in better pain control as compared to opioid monotherapy. Because JFA is likely to experience ongoing pain as a result of his trauma, multiple fractures, and surgery, he should be initiated on opioid analgesia. If he remains hypotensive, at risk for hemodynamic compromise, or is in renal failure, morphine should be avoided. Some centers would routinely use fentanyl or hydromorphone in most patients to minimize hemodynamic complications. It would be most appropriate to administer fentanyl as a continuous infusion, while hydromorphone could be given continuously or as repeated intravenous boluses. Because of his rib fractures, JFA could also be considered for thoracic epidural analgesia with an opioid. During his stay in the surgical ICU, JFA begins to exhibit signs of agitation including diaphoresis, tachycardia, pulling at his endotracheal tube, and even trying to strike his caregivers. So my next question to you is, what are some causes of agitation that JFA might be experiencing and how should he be initially treated? Agitation is very common in critically ill patients and can lead to adverse consequences arising from sympathomimetic effects. Patient care can be complicated if agitation leads to patient removal of devices, such as endotracheal tubes or intravenous lines, necessary for their care. Patients may exhibit symptoms of agitation for a variety of reasons including pain, delirium, hypoxemia, hypoglycemia, hypotension, or withdrawal from alcohol and other drugs. Given the ubiquity of pain in critically ill patients and the difficulty in assessing patients who cannot communicate, Clinicians should always consider pain as a potential cause of agitation and administer analgesics when they suspect pain. In fact, current guidelines recommend analgesia-first sedation strategies that emphasize aggressive use of analgesics before administration of sedative agents. Other general strategies to treat anxiety and agitation in critically ill patients include keeping patients as comfortable as possible, reorienting patients if they misperceive their surroundings or situations, promoting a normal sleep-wake cycle by helping patients to stay awake during the day and minimizing barriers to sleep overnight. Whenever possible, Clinicians should attempt to identify and treat the underlying cause of agitation before initiating a sedative agent. For instance, if an agitated patient is found to be hypoglycemic, 
the hypoglycemia should be corrected, and the patient should be re-evaluated before starting a sedative. By identifying and addressing the cause of agitation, clinicians can avoid complications associated with sedative medications, such as over-sedation and delirium. Clinicians should assess critically ill patients who are agitated using a validated sedation assessment tool. The two most rigorously evaluated tools are the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, abbreviated as RASS, and the Sedation Agitation Scale, abbreviated as SAS. Both tools effectively discriminate different levels of sedation, have high inter-rater reliability, and have been shown to correlate reasonably well with objective measures of brain function. Scores on the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale range from negative 5 to positive 4 while the Sedation Agitation Scale varies from 1 to 7. The lowest numbers of the scales indicate a patient is unarousable, while the highest numbers on the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale and Sedation Agitation Scale correspond to combativeness and dangerous agitation, respectively. By quantifying patients' level of sedation using one of these tools, multidisciplinary caregivers can determine the desired level of consciousness and appropriately administer medications to target this level of consciousness while avoiding excessive sedation. Generally, sedatives should be titrated to achieve light levels of sedation, which correspond to Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale scores of negative 1 to 0 and Sedation Agitation Scale scores of 3 to 4.37 maintaining patients at light levels of sedation instead of deeper levels of sedation, in which they are more difficult to arouse and are less interactive, has been shown to reduce duration of mechanical ventilation and ICU length of stay. Sometimes, Patients' clinical conditions may necessitate deeper levels of sedation. Some clinical situations in which deeper sedation may be appropriate include active severe alcohol withdrawal, refractory status epilepticus, intracranial hypertension, ventilator dyssynchrony, severe lung injury, or paralysis with neuromuscular receptor blocking agents. JFA may be agitated because of pain from his traumatic injuries as well as metabolic disturbances or other causes. His level of consciousness should be evaluated using the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale or Sedation Agitation Scale. Since he is intubated, JFA should be assessed for pain using a validated nonverbal pain assessment tool, and his pain should be treated if indicated. His vital signs should be evaluated to identify hypotension or hypoxia, and his blood glucose concentration should be measured. Abnormalities in these values should be corrected as needed. Clinicians should review JFA's past medical history, social history, and home medication list to identify any potential that he might be experiencing withdrawal from alcohol, illicit substances, or prescribed medications that he was taking before hospital admission such as benzodiazepines or opioids. If he is unaware of his surroundings or current condition, JFA should be reoriented. His sleep pattern should be addressed. Finally, the patient's current medication list should be reviewed for medications, such as steroids and anticholinergic drugs, that might cause behavioral changes and these medications should be discontinued if identified. Only after thoroughly assessing the patient for potentially reversible causes of agitation, should the healthcare team consider initiating a sedative medication with the goal of achieving a light level of sedation in JFA. The next question reads, if JFA requires sedation, which medication would be preferred? Several agents, including propofol, dexmedetomidine, and benzodiazepines, can be used to treat agitation in critically ill patients. No particular sedative is best for all patients. 
Although benzodiazepines have been widely used over time, recent guidelines suggest that propofol and dexmedetomidine are preferred in most patients because they may result in decreased ICU length of stay and duration of mechanical ventilation as compared to benzodiazepines. Decisions about the optimal sedative agent for individual patients depend on the reason for sedation and sedation goals, expected duration of sedation, pharmacology of the medication in the specific patient, and cost effectiveness. Propofol is a highly lipophilic sedative that binds to multiple receptors and exerts sedative, hypnotic, anxiolytic, antiemetic, and anticonvulsant properties. Because of its high lipophilicity and formulation in a 10% lipid emulsion, propofol readily crosses the blood-brain barrier and demonstrates a rapid onset of effect and quick offset after short-term use. However, patient awakening after prolonged use can be variable because of its deposition in adipose tissues. Propofol can be rapidly titrated in order to achieve the desired level of sedation. It is suited for regular awakenings that are required for neurologic examinations in patients with brain injuries, and it facilitates daily awakening as part of sedative and ventilator weaning protocols. Adverse effects of propofol include respiratory depression, hypotension resulting from vasodilation, bradycardia, hypertriglyceridemia, pancreatitis, myoclonus, and green or white discoloration of the urine. Because of the dose-dependent suppression of respiratory drive, continuous infusions of propofol should only be administered to patients who are mechanically ventilated. Patients should be regularly monitored for hypertriglyceridemia when receiving propofol over the course of several days and the drug should be stopped or weaned if significant hypertriglyceridemia develops. Patients with allergies to eggs, soybeans, and sulfites may experience allergic reactions because of components of the lipid emulsion and some generic formulations. In order to reduce burning and stinging associated with administration, propofol should be administered through large bore intravenous lines whenever possible. Although propofol is formulated with a preservative to prevent bacterial growth, product labeling suggests the bottles and tubing should be changed every 12 hours, and line integrity should be assessed to prevent bacterial contamination. The caloric load of the lipid vehicle should be considered when evaluating nutritional needs in patients receiving propofol. Propofol may cause a life-threatening syndrome called propofol infusion syndrome, abbreviated as PRE, in about 1% of patients. Propofol infusion syndrome is characterized by metabolic acidosis, hypertriglyceridemia, progressive hypotension, bradyarrhythmias, and cardiovascular collapse. Other complications of propofol infusion syndrome may include acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, rhabdomyolysis, and liver failure. Propofol infusion syndrome has been observed most commonly at doses exceeding 70 mcg per kilogram per minute and with use beyond 48 hours, but it has been reported at lower infusion rates and with shorter infusions. Because propofol infusion syndrome can be difficult to distinguish from other conditions in critically ill patients and because of its high mortality rate, members of the healthcare team should diligently monitor patients in order to rapidly identify propofol infusion syndrome. When propofol infusion syndrome is suspected, Propofol should be discontinued and patients should receive appropriate supportive care. Dexmedetumidine is a centrally acting alpha receptor agonist that is similar to clonidine. It demonstrates greater anxiolytic and fewer symptolytic properties as compared to clonidine. In addition to anxiolysis, dexmedetumidine also has sedative and opioid sparing effects. It does not have anticonvulsive characteristics, induce amnesia, or cause respiratory depression. 
Dexmedetumidine often allows patients to awaken more easily and better interact with caregivers as compared to propofol and benzodiazepines, but it is not appropriate for patients requiring deeper levels of sedation and those paralyzed with neuromuscular receptor antagonists. Dexmedetumidine starts working within approximately 15 minutes after the initiation of an infusion and reaches its peak effect at one hour. Clinicians may administer a bolus to achieve faster onset, but bolus administration is associated with increased risk of hemodynamic instability, which can manifest as either hypertension or hypotension and bradycardia. Additional adverse effects include nausea, atrial fibrillation, and, rarely, cardiogenic shock. In the United States, Dexmedetumidine is approved for use as a continuous infusion at doses up to 0.7 micrograms per kilogram per hour for a maximum of 24 hours, but clinical trials have demonstrated safety and effectiveness at doses up to 1.5 micrograms per kilogram per hour for as much as 28 days. Doses may be titrated every 30 minutes. Patients with severe hepatic disease may require lower doses of dexmedetomidine to avoid prolonged offset of effect and excessive hemodynamic effects. Dexmedetomidine-induced hypotension and bradycardia may occur more commonly in patients who are hypovolemic or those who have cardiovascular instability. Importantly, because dexmedetomidine does not cause respiratory depression, it can be continued during and after extubation, unlike propofol. When continuing dexmedetumidine in this fashion, clinicians should be aware that it may cause loss of oropharyngeal muscle tone, resulting in airway obstruction. Consequently, patients getting dexmedetumidine without mechanical ventilation must receive continuous respiratory monitoring. Benzodiazepines are GABA receptor agonists that demonstrate anxiolytic, sedative, hypnotic, and anticonvulsant effects. Current guidelines no longer recommend use of benzodiazepines as first-line sedatives in most critically ill patients, although they remain the mainstay of therapy for management of alcohol withdrawal. Benzodiazepines can potentiate respiratory failure and hypotension, especially when codeministered with opioids. They can also cause mental status changes and are risk factors for development of delirium. Patients may occasionally experience a paradoxical reaction involving agitation and restlessness. Elderly patients are more likely to experience adverse effects, while patients taking benzodiazepines prior to hospitalization and those on them for long periods of time may demonstrate decreased sensitivity. Usually, benzodiazepines are administered parenterally in the critical care setting, and the most commonly used agents are lorazepam and midazolam. Either lorazepam or midazolam may be given via intermittent or by continuous intravenous infusion but the two drugs have key differences relative to their pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, and adverse effect profiles. Because it is more lipophilic, midazolam has a faster onset and shorter duration of action than lorazepam. However, because midazolam deposits in the adipose tissue, it can lead to variable and prolonged awakening when it is administered continuously over the course of several days. Midazolam undergoes hepatic metabolism to an active metabolite, which is eliminated renally, while lorazepam is inactivated in the liver. Both agents should be used cautiously in renal and hepatic dysfunction, because end-organ impairment prolongs the elimination half-life of both drugs. Lorazepam is formulated in a propylene glycol vehicle, which can accumulate at doses as low as 1 mg per kilogram per day and cause metabolic acidosis and acute kidney injury. When benzodiazepines must be used clinicians should carefully manage the dosing regimen to target the desired level of sedation at the lowest dose possible.
Avoiding continuous infusions of benzodiazepines in favor of as-needed bolus doses based on symptoms of agitation may result in decreased total benzodiazepine exposure and a lower chance of benzodiazepine-related complications. After thoroughly assessing JFA and addressing reversible causes of agitation such as metabolic disorders and withdrawal syndromes, Sedation with propofol should be considered if he remains agitated and his hemodynamics are adequate. Propofol and dexmedetomidine are both suggested first-line sedatives according to current guidelines. However, because JFA may require frequent awakenings for neurologic examinations, the faster offset of effect with propofol may make it more appropriate. JFA's blood pressure and heart rate should be monitored when propofol is started, and it should be titrated to a light level of sedation based on the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale or Sedation Agitation Scale. His triglyceride concentrations should be evaluated periodically if propofol is administered for several days, and clinicians should be aware of the symptoms of propofol infusion syndrome in order to identify any potential episodes as soon as possible. After receiving care in the ICU and remaining intubated and lightly sedated for several days, JFA's sedation is lightened, but he does not seem to be himself. He alternates between unresponsiveness and agitation. He is unable to tell caregivers where he is or answer simple questions. So my question to you reads, could JFA be experiencing delirium? Delirium is a symptom of acute brain dysfunction that involves the following combination of symptoms. Acute change or fluctuation from baseline mental status, inattention, and disorganized thinking or altered level of consciousness. Patients who are delirious may experience hallucinations, delusions, or hyperactivity, but these symptoms are not present in all delirious patients. In fact, three different forms of delirium have been described based on the symptoms that patients demonstrate. In hyperactive delirium, patients are agitated, while in hypoactive delirium, they are calm or lethargic. Patients with mixed delirium fluctuate between these two subtypes. Delirium occurs at least once during the ICU stay in up to 80% of critically ill patients and is associated with negative patient outcomes, including increased mortality, ICU and hospital length of stay, long-term cognitive impairment, and healthcare costs. Clinicians are more likely to fail to identify delirium if patients manifest hypoactive delirium rather than hyperactive delirium. In order to identify patients who have delirium, current guidelines recommend that clinicians routinely assess patients several times each day using a validated delirium assessment tool. The two recommended tools for assessing delirium are called the Confusion Assessment Method for the ICU, abbreviated as COME-ICU, and the Intensive Care Delirium Screening Checklist, abbreviated as ICDSC. Based on his symptoms, JFA is likely experiencing delirium. It is clear that his mental status has changed from baseline as he does not seem to be himself. In addition, the fluctuation between unresponsiveness and agitation combined with the inattention and disorganized thinking he is exhibiting by not being able to answer simple questions fulfill the other criteria of delirium. Clinicians should formally evaluate JFA for delirium using a validated tool such as the confusion assessment method for the ICU or the intensive care delirium screening checklist. The next question reads, how should clinicians work to prevent and treat delirium in critically ill patients like JFA? There are a variety of modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors associated with the development of delirium in critically ill patients. 
Non-modifiable risk factors include baseline dementia, hypertension, alcoholism, and greater severity of illness. Current evidence suggests that benzodiazepine exposure, very deep sedation, and anticholinergic medications may increase the risk that patients develop delirium. Any association between opioids and propofol and delirium is unclear because of conflicting and limited evidence, respectively. Evidence suggests delirium may be prevented with early mobilization protocols, in which nurses, physical therapists, and other clinicians assist critically ill patients in getting out of bed and ambulating. Studies of these protocols have demonstrated that they are safe and associated with significant reductions in delirium, hospital and ICU length of stay, and duration of mechanical ventilation when used in critically ill patients. No pharmacologic therapy has been shown to prevent delirium in heterogeneous groups of critically ill patients. Although haloperidol has been used historically to treat delirium in critically ill patients, there is an absence of high-quality published literature in broad groups of critically ill patients. Consequently, current guidelines make no recommendations regarding the use of haloperidol for treatment of delirium. Atypical antipsychotics may be considered to help reduce the duration of delirium. However, published literature supporting their use is very limited. Evidence suggests that using dexmedetomidine instead of a benzodiazepine for management of agitation may result in less delirium. Delirium can be prevented in patients like JFA through the use of early mobilization protocols and minimizing risk factors for delirium such as benzodiazepines. No pharmacologic strategy has been convincingly demonstrated to reduce delirium, although evidence suggests that atypical antipsychotics might have some role and could be considered. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 345.